Assalamu alaikum. Hello and good afternoon. I hope that Ramadan is going well, inshallah. We are nearing the end soon. You are listening to Atiya Ali on the Mental Health and Emotional Wellbeing Show on Ramadan Radio Wolverhampton, online on ramadanradiowolves.com. You can also find us on YouTube, hit subscribe, <laughs> and on Facebook. In this show, we hope to provide information that may be helpful to support your well-being and the well-being of others, because everyone's mental health matters. You can listen back to this and previous shows on Ramadan Radio's YouTube channel, alongside finding further mental health information on my ex-feed at Atiyah Ali 3. We are not here to offer you advice in place of your clinician. However, we will share information that may encourage you to seek support. If you feel you need to discuss your health and well-being following this show, then please contact your GP. You are welcome to send in comments regarding the show via the WhatsApp messaging number on 07-440-420-432. In the previous show, last Saturday, we focused on PTSD and trauma-based symptoms. We also touched on well-being and looking after oneself amidst the current crisis in the Middle East, specifically in Gaza and beyond. In the show today, we will be discussing self-care in relation to emotional well-being. Being mindful of our mental health is vital during these stressful times. When we are feeling unwell mentally, physically or both, we sometimes can't think as clearly as we were when we were well. Uh, this has an impact on our emotional resilience, leading us to feel less in control with our emotions. And usually, easy tasks can become difficult to complete. How can we build our emotional resilience? What helps? It is suggested that one of the first steps to mood management and emotional resilience would be noticing any mood change and recognising differences. We may notice when that we have dipped in mood or when we are worrying more than usual or more than needed in a given situation. Once we recognise we need to feel better in mood or feel less worried, we can focus on how to help ourselves feel better. We hear a lot about self-help within mental health. Mostly psychologists and psychotherapists tend to provide mind-relaxing exercises in between sessions. We ended the last radio show thinking about managing emotions and self-help and welcome this opportunity to hear more about this topic. Our guest, Rajnish Burke, a cognitive behavioural therapist, will provide insight into different ways of managing emotions. Hi, and welcome to Ramadan Radio's Mental Health and Emotional Wellbeing show, Rajnish. Hi, Atir. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for your time. You. We'll go straight into it, Raj. Um, would it be okay to inform our listeners about what causes a sudden peak in emotions we talked a little bit about um i mentioned there about sudden peak in emotion in terms of not being able to manage emotions can you tell yeah. us a bit about why this might occur yeah it can be many reasons and it can be very individual to the person as to why that may be happening it can be commonly due to some kind of mental health issue like maybe suffering from anxiety depression low self-esteem trauma like you said you've discussed before some other mental health issue but it can also be due to general stress as well that you may be going through in life due to many different reasons could be financial could be things to do at home going on could be to do with relationship issues could be to do with housing issues mm. or children issues any, anything else with mm. education issues that could trigger a spike in emotion ultimately and it also sometimes can be things that you're going through that you haven't really picked up on and affecting you bit by bit by bit like a drip drip effect and eventually gives you a sudden spike in emotion because you just can't cope, in a sense. Mm. And that can lead to emotional kind of a, an increase of, of, a, of different types, depending on what you're going through and what the emotion is. Mm. Mm. Yeah. OK, so we talked a little bit about kind of what can cause a sudden peak. So you said like the drip, drip feed. And in the mm -hmm. show last week, we were talking about looking at um, social media or the news and, and watching yeah, kind of right. horrific images and... And, and how a person might respond to that emotionally. Um, so you, you, you're saying that having exposure to certain situations might also lead to a sudden surge in emotion. 
Yeah, definitely can do. It all depends on how much really you inter you let you let it affect you by how you interpret it. Because what we know is with different situations, we can all interpret the same situation in different ways, and that can then affect, kind of affect how we feel and how we cope. So, mm -hmm. for example, you might watch something and you might not get any effect from it. You might not get a sudden shift in your mood yeah. or sudden increase in emotion. But someone else can watch that same thing, and the way they think about it can affect how they feel and how they cope and what emotion they get. That might be quite heightened. So a lot of it is very um, individual to the person based on what they've gone through, what they're witnessing, and can give us a push. So the same person may not get that effect compared to another person. So it's not... So it's very important to, when we look at mental health or what you're going through, to make it very personal to the person and to what they're going through and not to think that everyone is going to go through the same thing because everyone's very individual in that way. Mm. So we can have differing responses um, depending on a person's background, uh, experiences, etc. Is that what you mean? Yes, definitely, because we know, for example, that if someone's got watch, watching something or going through something and they've got, they get some shift in mood from, saying they, for example, they go through anxiety, mm -hmm. another person for that same situation may be depressed. Mm -hmm. And that's all due to, a lot of the time, it can be based on what they've just gone through recently, but a lot of the time what we tend to see is that could also be based on what they've gone through in their life and the way they've interpreted certain things in their life and how it's left mm -hmm. them with certain thoughts that as they go on in life, start to kind of get affected and then give them a sudden mood shift, really. And then they get caught up in that and it kind of continues and continues to affect them where it creates anxiety, depression, high, high stress levels, mm. um, maybe emotional effects of low self-esteem or maybe trauma-like effects in a sense. So it is, and so it, the emotion that you go through is going to be very individual to you. One person may have a depression in one state that's another person that same situation may have anxiety or heightened mm. stress and it's all dependent on what you've gone through really in a sense mm. and your like own life experiences how you interpret things what you kind of take as you're learning from could be a childhood experiences could be a culture could be your societal issues could mm. be certain rules you create for yourself about how you cope that ultimately have that effect really right so i think what you're alluding to there is kind of um, impact on our emotional regulation. What, what do we mean by emotional regulation? Why is it helpful to regulate our emotions? Well, emotional regulation is how ultimately we have any kind of emotion that's not, even a good emotion, like happiness or sadness or anxiety or stress, it's about regulating regular into a level where it doesn't affect our quality of life or our functioning day to day. And so it's regulated that even if we are stressed or anxious, we manage it in a way for a situation that doesn't really affect how we behave or how we cope in a way that's unhelpful for us. Maybe our relationships, maybe our functioning at work, maybe our ability to do day to day things that take care of ourselves. That mm. means that we are emotionally regulated in ourselves. When mm. we end up not having emotional regulation is when we end up getting affected by situations in life that affect us in such a way that affects our day-to-day -day function, how we react in certain situations, mm -hmm. how we are in certain situations, maybe going to work, maybe studying, maybe how we are in relationships, maybe we isolate ourselves away, maybe we might stop taking care of ourselves. Then we end up having an emotion that's not being regulated and it affects everything else beyond us in a sense. So mm -hmm. when we learn to emotion regulate, it means mm. that we don't, doesn't mean we won't get that emotion. It's very normal to have certain emotions like stress, anxiety, depression, etc. But it's managed in such a way that the reaction we're getting is not going to affect us in a long term way and cause an impact on our quality of life or functioning in a very negative way, in a sense. Mm. So, emotional regulation is trying to manage our emotions. Yes, yeah, manage our emotions in a way that. Even if we do get affected, it doesn't continue to affect us in the long term and it doesn't become like a cycle, like a vicious cycle of so we're starting to get triggered a lot in similar situations in a sense, really. So, for example, if I am um, emotionally regulated, if I have stress in my life from a certain thing, say a relationship issue, mm -hmm. then what will happen is if I'm emotionally regulated in the way I manage my emotions, I will maybe get upset if I fight my partner. But then what I will also do is be able to contain that emotion to a level that I can continue with my day and be, be okay in a sense. But if I get very emotionally unregulated and I end up kind of being emotional in a way that really affects how I function the day, I may not want to do anything, I may get anxious, it may affect how I interact with my partner on the long term 
or how I am in my life, then it goes into emotional regulation because they're not regulating the emotion so it doesn't affect our day-to-day in a sense. Then that's something mm-hmm. that can become like a, if it's continuous and if it's really affecting like a kind of a mental health issue, a common one in a sense that we can manage and contain with therapy or some other kind of support, but it can it kind of can go into that, that, that aspect of affecting us day-to-day if it does go there. But if you manage it, it's because we've got those resources in us to maybe get emotionally upset, which we may need to, but then be able to contain it, yeah. and regulate our emotion and be able to continue with our day. And also rationalise the situation. Think about it in a way that allows us to move from not just... okay. Ooh, We're losing you a little well, bit there, right? We're losing you a little bit there, Yeah, sorry to cut you there, Rajnish. We're losing you okay. a little bit in terms of yeah, your connection. Um, yep, we can oh, hear sorry. you. So, so you were saying there that emotional dysregulation is when it uh, continues longer than it needs to and it kind of um, filters in to other areas of your life. Is that right? Yes, that's very much correct, yeah, because it can do, in a sense, and it, and it depends on the situation. It may feel to try that just a certain area of your life continuously in, in a similar situation or depending mm-hmm. on the nature of what you're going through, it mm-hmm. may go kind of filtrate to different areas of your life. It may filtrate mm-hmm. to your relationships, into your work, into your socialising, into just your day-to-day function, like taking care of yourself, going to the gym or something, or just being with your family. Mm-hmm. Or it may be quite specific, depending on the presentation of the emotion, to to where, down, where you're going, in a sense, really. Mm-hmm. So it is very much um, quite... It, it is something that you can't really say that every person will have that same emotion, same situation. You do have to really work with a person to understand what they're going through and mm-hmm. then understand what is the emotional regulation they're going through and how is it impacting them to understand mm-hmm. that is it anxiety, is it depression, is it they're very heightened in stress and can't manage that in a sense. Mm-hmm. And then looking at how is it affecting their day to day to know are they emotionally unregulated or are they be able to manage their emotions. Right. Thank you. That's really informative. So once a person notice, I mean, some people probably cannot notice when they're feeling emotionally dysregulated. Um, what, how would they be able to notice that? Is it when it seeps into other areas of their life or what else? What other signs do you think they would be able to notice? Well, the signs can be quite different, buddy, and they can be um, they can be different in their natures for the same for, for the one person. So sure. the signs can be either, for example, in the way you're feeling initially, because we tend to notice our emotions quite easily. So, mm-hmm. for example, what we mean by that is maybe they're noticing they're getting very anxious all of a sudden. Maybe they're noticing they're getting very panicky all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Maybe you know, maybe they're getting physical symptoms of anxiety, like maybe heart racing, chest tightening, out of breath, maybe getting hot all of a sudden, nausea, common symptoms of anxiety in a sense, maybe you want to go to the toilet all of a sudden. These are very common symptoms that interlink with anxiety in a sense and can be heightened when you're emotionally dysregulated. So one emotion can be anxiety that they may notice. If it's depression, that they're noticing their emotions has been dysregulated with depression, they may notice that they also feel quite down, they may feel quite low, they may feel like they don't have any energy in their body, maybe get aches and pains in their body, they may notice that they kind of haven't got the motivation to do anything or many things, their concentration may be affected, um, they find it hard to remember things as much, because much as the emotion is there, it's also the symptom that gives biologically as physically as well in a sense they may get kind of the notes they're very down their negative thinking so a lot of a lot of the time when a person is emotionally dysregulated they may notice that they're spiraling in their thinking thinking very negative and they're thinking about things over and over again or they're worrying and panicking about something they're thinking oh my god something bad's going to happen and they're getting stuck there and they're mm-hmm. worrying about it they can't stop thinking a sense about it mm-hmm. in a sense and they try to cope by try to avoid mm-hmm. in a sense or reassurance seek in a sense because in regulate because emotions isn't just about what the emotion itself it's also about the physical symptoms it gives you that can make you aware that emotions are dysregulated mm-hmm. and it can also be how you behave as well and how you cope when you feel that way that makes you aware actually my emotions aren't regulated right now I'm noticing a dip in my mood or a sudden spike of stress it could also be irritable around people they may want to isolate themselves away they may not want to do things they used to do that they enjoyed like maybe spend time with the family 
going to work. They may start worrying about things as much more, you know, and they notice that and has not affected their mood. Maybe start to make excuses to, to not do anything. And um, then maybe you not want to avoid thinking about what is worrying about them, making them worry in a sense. And then they'll start to notice, oh, I'm feeling down, I'm feeling low in a sense. So mm. it can be very many things, but it's sort of in looking at how am I normally when I'm in a good, in a good state? And actually, I'm not like that anymore. And I notice I'm either down, depressed, anxious. I'm thinking more. Maybe I'm much more in my mind rather than I'm actually present in a situation, like with my family. Yeah. In a sense. So being a bit distant. Yeah, being distant. You know, maybe you're talking to your dad's talking to you, and then you're just not there really in that moment. You feel like you're just in another world. You maybe not even know what you're thinking about, but you're just literally not there, present, which can happen with trauma sometimes. In the mm. sense, you may also notice that you're at work, but you're not as motivated to work. You're kind of, you know, putting things off. Maybe you're, pro- you know, you may be kind of not talking to your colleagues as much. In a sense, if you're at work, you might kind of put yourself away in a different room or something. So these little little signs can be ways of asking yourself that when you start to become aware, you know, is this my is this my mood affecting me? Is this going something going on for me that I've not really recognised? Because sometimes people may not recognise the way they're feeling as much as they know, well, I've started to distance myself away. Or, or maybe even a family member may say, you know, why are you not with us, um, you know, downstairs as much? You know, why are you in your bedroom all the time? Or, you know, why are you going out with us much? Or, you know, are you, like maybe school has said, you know, you're not doing your homework as much, you know, you're not, etc. So sometimes other people can pick up on it, maybe not yourself as much. You know, and then you start to say, well, actually, what's going on? You know, how am I being? You know, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? You know, and it's really yeah. so it's many different things. But Thank ultimately, you. the more you have an inner awareness, the more you can kind of understand. Yeah. So is getting that awareness of what, what are the changes and, and what's different from your usual way of behaving? Um, and if that was a way of behaving um when you're feeling well um so i'm I'm going to move on a little bit now and and think about i mean i know raj that you have a background in working with um the global majority or uh ethnic minorities within the uk in your community development work um i'm just wondering when it comes to things like yoga or meditation um and and praying so specific cultural kind of um things that people use to help them emotionally regulate or to feel better um how is that helpful can you tell us more about this is there any evidence for it yeah definitely for example and I, in, in the, when i was working with ethnic community what we didn't tend to see was that a lot of people would turn to religion as a source of comfort which is very important because a lot of the time when you do get depressed or your emotions do change to an, um, a level that may be affecting you some um, quite a lot then sometimes finding solace in what you've always found before, like religion, can be very comforting. It can give you guidance. It can give you support, in a sense, because you can turn to the books and maybe read them and understand them. And especially in times difficult, they may have some sayings in there that can help you. I mean, I had a client who's from Punjabi, and I had a session with them today, and they were quite depressed. And they spoke about how God to the temple you know praying for them was very important so we worked on getting back into that and we looked at we actually looked in the session at some um, scripture lines from the um, for a guru bani what they call this Sikh book to look at what does it say about when you're struggling and that helped them you know see that actually it does say you will go through struggles but you will work through it you have the faith have the faith and it mm. helped them kind of put that into line with what they were going through and apply it to themselves to help them right, so, so it's so about Things like reading the Quran um, for 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 Ramadan yeah. radio um, listeners and um, uh, and connecting, praying, um, being more spiritual can help people feel a bit more um, at ease is and reassured. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Because at the time when you're feeling very down, very anxious, you do feel like you're the only one going through it. Mm. In a sense, and sometimes as much as other people can say, "Don't worry, you'll be okay," or you know. But it's sometimes just going to something like maybe a scripture or a book or something that gives mm-hmm. you guidance and light to see that this sure. is a normal thing to happen and you will get, yes. you'll be okay and it is a part of life and there is ways to manage it in a sense. And you have got support and guidance. And by praying, it gives you some awareness that you're, you know, you're not alone here. Mm. And, and for your client, did you find it, um, it had a positive impact on her, the example that you used? 
Yeah, definitely, because what we kind of recognised was that they had gone away from reading the Gurbani, the, the Sikh book, because they were so depressed. And so when we looked at a few scripture lines from online, we just looked online mm. and said, well, let's just have a look. Mm. And what we kind of read was a few verses about kind of difficulties in life and allowed them to see that, yes, this is also part of their, in, our, in our religion. It does say it, is, it does happen, but actually, you, if you have faith, you can be okay. You suffer. Yeah. Allowed them to see actually, yeah, I'm just going to go back to believing and back to what I was doing before in my reading the book, in praying mm. in the morning, and you know, and we put that into kind of how they can help themselves get better, really, like a like an actual time they can do it in sure. a sense, you know, forget and not think about it because they're depressed, and right. that help them. So I'm thinking about um, the five daily prayers and um, how a person, if they were reading all five of their prayers or as many as they could pray um and then that helps them spiritually cleansing themselves beforehand and then also it's a bit um of a, a yoga um type exercise um when yeah. they when you're praying namas i find uh, and, and also the grounding and the spirituality and the connecting yeah. to god and um finding that time to just be present and fully present um i can is there any evidence around that in terms of how that helps. There, I don't think there's any much scientific evidence around it because research hasn't been done too much into it. But what we do know is, is that when we do have mental health issues, we tend not to go within. We go within our body, maybe in the way we feel physically, emotionally, but we don't mm. tend to go within, we go external. In a sense, because mm. we can't cope with the emotions or the thoughts. So actually by using religion as the way to go within and to trust and to give us guidance in prayer, in, like you said, grounding ourselves to where we are present now in, in actually not the mm. thoughts that are making you worry, but the mm. thoughts that will give you hope through prayer mm. and, and mm. really allow us to see, I have got the answer within me, you know, I will be okay. Because a lot of the time, a lot of people with depression, anxiety are scared to go within because of what they're thinking, mm. they'll avoid their thoughts. So it actually allows them to have that courage to do that and say, actually, they can be okay by going within. So it yeah. really allows to be a way to do that and to be comforted yeah. by that and i think there is evidence about um prayer and um bit feeling grounded and, and supporting it supporting one's well-being so i'm thinking in particular about being present and um you said it, yeah. something up there about connecting with thoughts and um mm -hmm. thoughts that, that people might try to escape from so for example um in in the uh dua which is the the um supplication at the end the, the request at the end from god or, or being fully present in your own kind of difficulties and asking for help from god um from allah it, it might be really um helpful in terms of connecting with what's difficult what have you found difficult in your day and what's difficult in your life and where do you need the support so it allows that time for reflection and, and seeking support does that make sense no, definitely. And I think that's what the kind of therapy is about as well. That's what getting ourselves better is about, is a goal internal and within mm -hmm. and reflecting, in mm -hmm. a sense. Because a lot of the time, mental health, people tend to avoid not wanting to address their emotions or their thoughts because it's, it's scary. So part mm -hmm. of it, I mean, actually, by going within and reflecting is what you need to actually grow. Because mm -hmm. that's where the learning is, in a sense. And that's where the confronting is. And religion and your scriptures can also give you guidance and can give you answers because it is there within you. We just mm -hmm allow ourselves to have the confidence and the support to do that whether it's through religion whether it's through just your own inner reflection to go within is very important because that's where a lot of time we get better from thank you um for for that information Rajnish. we're going into the break but on the other side i'm sure you'll tell us more about grounding um and we look forward to speaking to you on the other side stay with us thank you assalamu alaikum Hello and welcome back. You're listening to Ati Ali on the Emotional Wellbeing Show, Mental Health and Emotional Wellbeing Show. And with us is our guest, Rajanish Burke, a cognitive behavioural therapist. And she's been talking to us about managing emotions, uh, regulating emotions and, and how we can think of ways to do that. Um, and I think we'll move on to kind of solid um, examples, Rajanish, if that's OK, in terms of grounding. So welcome back. Thank you. Um, you, allude, you alluded earlier to grounding. Um, what do you mean by this? And can you share some examples? Yeah. So grounding is basically a, a way of bringing your emotions back to the ground and bringing your um, emotions stabilised. 
through grounding because at the time when we have any kind of stress going on anxiety depression the most these are the most common kind of mental health issues that most people will have or at least one in four people will have the research shows although it is growing um what we tend to be is we tend to be stuck in our mind in terms of we tend to be with the worry with the with the kind of what's going on so we're very much in our head more than we are physically present in a situation where we are or even in our own body and it actually grounded in a way you know in our actually where we are present to what we do you know where we are and involved so as a result what we can't talk about with grounding it means how do we ground ourselves to where we come present to where we are in the in the here and now so we're less in our mind and more present to the situation because if we're less in our mind we're not going to worry as much we're going to be present in the situation which actually isn't threatening isn't hopefully stressful not to say that that's always the case but most situations will be that way and also is not depressing so as a result when we ground ourselves it means that we're not really getting caught up in our mind that is making us have the anxiety the stress the depression the low mood the worry the irritability in a sense and when we're present to the moment we're more likely going to be calm we're going to be less stressed we're going to be managing the situation better as well we're going to be more aware of what we're doing how we are and how we're feeling as well in a good way so, so and grounding is very much about being present to the moment, and there are different ways to do this. And also, a lot of times, especially what I see in the Asian community or in the ethnic community, is that, especially with the older community generation, is when we have spoke about mental health, not all of them, but a lot of more the ethnic, kind of older community tend to understand mental health either from perspective of physical symptoms, not so much for mental health symptoms and the thoughts right. and the behaviours. Mm-hmm. They tend to say example that they are oh, got a headache or if i've got pain going on that they you know my legs are hurting aching or that yeah. they you know i've got digestive issues going on and they'll be going to the doctors and the doctors do test and they'll come back fine and sometimes even doctors don't pick up on it because the way they're going to the doctors about it is more physical representation of symptoms rather than actually well i'm feeling low today i'll be worrying about this you know, I've been anxious because they don't really understand that as much. It's not really been there in the community to understand. So they'll present more with the physical symptoms. That's what, that's what they understand. They understand I've got aches and pains, I've got a headache going on. My muscles are hurting. But actually, if it's been continued for some time, they've gone to a doctor and actually all the tests are done, it's all fine. Then it's about being inquisitive with a person. Maybe it could be your grandma, your grandparent, an elder in the home, and saying, actually, are they feeling down? Are they feeling depressed? Are they maybe staying quiet more often? You know, are they maybe not doing things around the home more often like they used to? Because sometimes, because they don't understand mental health, they'll kind of present it in the physical symptoms way and they won't know that actually not doing as much as they used to or they'll put it down to the pain in their body. But we know with depression, a lot of people with depression, they tend to have a lot of kind of physical manifestation through the way of aches and pains and tiredness and fatigue if it's quite strong or kind of lack of motivation. Mm-hmm. And that's, and so as a result, it gets mistaken for just something else, but in a sense. So if you do have an elder in the family who is saying they've got all these symptoms, but yet you've gone to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, we've done tests, there's nothing wrong with them, then actually maybe you may be looking at, you know, how they're behaving, are they more quieter, are they worried about something, you know, are they irritable, because it may be that they may be depressed in a sense, or maybe a bit anxious, and they don't really know that because they don't understand that in a sense. So mm-hmm. that's just something to kind of consider if that is happening, really. But going back to grounding, with grounding, yeah. because you're very much in your head, even if you don't feel like it, but your emotions are stating you very much in your head because of your anxiety means you're going to be worried or depression means you're going to be feeling very low and you're going to be thinking about things in a very negative way. Then grounding yeah. is basically getting you back to the present and, gra- and ground as well, because when we're grounded, when we're like, for example, if you go out to the garden and you sit down, it's very calming, very, very soothing, it's very peaceful, which means that you're going to be much present in the situation. You're not going to be really caught up in your mind as much, in a sense. So with grounding, there are different ways when you are stressed, when you are anxious, when you are depressed, that you can ground yourself, in a sense. And what will work for you may not work for another person. So it's about experimenting and see what works for you to get to get your own little technique in place so you can ground yourself and bring yourself back to the present not be caught up and one of the ways to do that like we discussed before could be turn to religion maybe praying because that means if you're in your mind you're more grounded to kind of something that's going to anchor you and make you feel secure and 
around and um, safe in a sense through prayer mm. or it could be through a basic technique is basically deep breathing got really using your breath and breathing in through your through your nose and taking your abdomen out and chest out to really go really focus on your breath because when mm. you focus on your breath and you're anxious or you're stressed or you're depressed it can really allow you to not only calm your nervous system down that triggers off the, what we call the fight or flight response and anxiety or stress more so in anxiety mm. it cut calms your cortisol levels down which is your stress hormone and when you just focus on your breath it takes you away from your inner thoughts or your feelings you're feeling and it moves that energy around that is stuck energy it could be anxiety it could be your stress that's stuck in your body depression and it moves it around because your you know, breath you come deeper and calms you down mm. and with that we, if you do it a few times maybe five five minutes or so just long slow deep breaths in and out what you will notice is over time that you'll start to you'll be more present focused, you're more calmer, and you're less stressed. Mm. And that's so you, sorry, man. You you said that long, slow, deep breaths. I mean, how would you guide someone through that? How, would it be would it be yeah. counting, or how would we do that? Yeah. So basically, what you could do is say, for example, if I'm getting anxious at my desk at work, mm. and I'm starting to for whatever reason it could be I'm stressed about maybe the project I'm doing, I'm worried it's going to fail. And I start thinking and worrying about it. Oh, my God, I'm going to fail. I'm going to yeah. fail. What's the magic angry at me? I might notice my breathing changes or I'm getting a bit more hotter. Common symptoms mm -hmm. of anxiety because the fight or flight response kicked off. So I might then I say, might... okay, I'm going to pause. And what I'll do is I'll settle back in my chair and I'll just put my hand on my abdomen if I need to, on my abdomen and my chest. Mm -hmm. So in your stomach? I'll... Yeah, my stomach. And then I'll take some very long, slow, deep breaths in through my nose. And really mm. focus on your breath and then bring that breath down to your chest so your chest is coming out and then to your abdomen and your stomach's coming out. And you can maybe do that as either a four and an eight. There are different number ones you can do. So mm. some of them like a four and eight where you breathe in for four. So you count to four when your breath is going down right to your stomach and your stomach comes out. Right. So that's through your nose. Yeah, through your nose. You can do it through your mouth if you don't, maybe if you've got a big block of nose, you can do it through your mouth. But the best way to suggest it is mouth closed and not through your nose. Mm. And then you, the breath goes right down to your stomach coming out and your chest coming out. Really take your stomach, your, you use your breath to like balloon out. And then do that, go counting four down, like one, two, three, four, mm. to your stomach going out. Then pause there for a second or two seconds or a bit more if you can or whatever feels comfortable for you. And then slowly, very, very slowly, at the count of um, counting eight, or if you want a bit less, because it might be a bit long for some people, maybe mm -hmm. just slowly yeah. bring your breath. Imagine you have your breath going down, so your stomach is going down, and the breath is coming right up, and you're counting this. So eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and the breath is coming right up, so it's coming back out through your nose or your mouth, whichever way you feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. you do that amount of eight. And then you so keep... it's in through your nose yep. for four, let's say. Yeah. Deep breath in, you're feeling your abdomen rise, and yep. then hold it for a couple of seconds or so, or whatever's comfortable, and then breathe it out through your mouth fully. Yeah, yeah fully, yes, fully, yeah. And mm -hmm. just do it a few times or however many times you feel like you need to, depending on the level of emotion you have, that's quite strong. Mm -hmm. and then just by concentrating on your breath and nothing else putting your full concentration on your breath it will take you away from your thoughts and your emotions and it will ground you back to the here and now and mm -hmm. you also you, have, you you will have calmed your nervous system down that's going to be of overdrive because of the stress or the anxiety or the depression's lifted a bit because you've used your breath to calm yourself down and got a bit of energy moving in the body in a sense mm -hmm. so that's one way of doing that mm -hmm. um, we're you using know, you again a little bit right right just oh, sorry, you know, can, can, we're just losing you again a little bit um but yeah so go ahead sorry so, so that was the breathing mm -hmm. yeah that's breathing the other way the other way you can ground yourself is becoming present to what is here and now so this is where if you're very anxious and stressed and again you're getting caught up in your emotions your physical symptoms of the anxiety or your mind then simply take a deep breath as we discussed and then just really focusing on what is around you Richie, say to, use your senses to really just become present to what is here now. So, and you describe that in your mind. So what you say is, I can feel my feet, you know, really focus on your feet on the ground or in your shoes. You know, what do they feel like? Are they hot? Are they cold? 
Can you mm. feel his socks? Like, can you feel the ground? And then move on to maybe the chair you're on. You know, what does a chair feel like? It's cold, you know, it's maybe cold. It's maybe, you know, hard chair. It's maybe soft chair. Maybe your surroundings. You know, what I see, I can see the wall. It's grey. By doing that, really go into detail about just becoming present to what is here and now and not your thoughts, the anxiety. You're calming your anxiety down and your stress because you're focusing on everything that is not stressful or triggering you. And you're describing things that are present here that is going to calm anxiety down because no longer is it worrying or stressing about something that's in your mind. It's just describing to you, you're describing everything around you that's not stressful or anxiety provoking. And also makes you present to the moment now to ground yourself to the here and now. So mm-hmm. by doing that for a couple of minutes, just so that enough, you can really bring yourself back. You may also wish to say to yourself, okay, where am I? I'm in my bedroom. You know, what can you know what, what day is it? It's Monday. You know, um, what am I sitting on the bed? By doing that, you, if you have got a heightened level of anxiety, it can bring you back to the present and ground you back to the here and now. Right. So that sounds like connecting with your surroundings. Yes, yeah, using your senses to the fullest. You can even say what you're hearing. What can I hear? I can hear the cars going outside or I can hear the music on the radio downstairs. You know, what song is it? The more you engage with that, really just get concentrated on answering the questions about what you're sensing, the more likely you're going to bring yourself out of your anxiety and stress and bring yourself back to the present moment and be able to ground yourself back to the here and now, which means you're going to be less stressed and less anxious, in a sense, or depressed. Right. That, that sounds really helpful. So really noticing what, what you can hear and connecting with the environment, what you can feel. I think you said there you're inside your shoes and um, anything else like taste? Yes. Um, sorry? Anything else like taste? So looking at senses? Yes, is, that, taste, is that what yeah. you meant? So you may, yeah. So you may wish to say, what well, can I taste in my mouth? You know, mm-hmm. even if you've not got anything in your mouth, you may just say, well, I can feel my tongue in my mouth. You know, I can feel it rolling around my mouth. Yeah, I can feel mm-hmm. it quite, you know, wet. Just mm-hmm. really get using your full senses, you know, whatever is available to you, to really mm-hmm. become present to what is here and now, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, the more you, because anxiety and depression and stress only grow when you focus on it, whether it's mm-hmm. focusing on your thoughts, yeah. it's focusing on your physical symptoms occurring because of it, or it's focusing on your behaviours. The more you get caught up with all of that, you're mm-hmm. less present to the here and now and you're less grounded which means it's going to grow. The anxiety is going to grow, the depression is going to grow, the stress is going to grow. Mm. So to do that, before we can even address the thoughts or the behaviours, we have to first get ourselves present to the here and now. In a sense, right. doing these simple techniques like by using your sight, by using what you can hear, yeah. by using what you can taste, by using what you can touch. I can mm. touch the table, it's cold, it's mm. wood, mm. you know, shiny, you know, but what you can feel. Smell, Yeah. You know, can really help you become present and take you away from what's going on internally or mm. internally within you that's making you feel the way you are. In a sure, and, it, and I'm sitting here next to my candle and, and you can smell it quite clearly. And I suppose that that's a connection, really, isn't it? It's a grounding. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, and if you do have anxiety or stress quite a bit, and especially if you're outside, for example, and you get a bit stressed, you can even, if you wish to, which some of our patients do, is, um, you know, keep something with you that you can either touch or you can mm. smell or you can taste that you can keep in your bag or, a little, you know, wallet or something or purse that then if you do ever get anxious outside, you can actually, t- you know, just take a time, pause for a second, you know, mm. sit down, maybe if there's a bench or just stand up wherever you may be and just take your time really using that to, for your senses to get yourself grounded to the here and now. So, mm. for example, meditation you will get very anxious outside. So we worked through the anxiety. And then what we did is we worked on a technique where when they were in the supermarket and they got very anxious, they would pause rather than try to rush through the supermarket and increase anxiety more because they're feeding it by rushing. Sure. And, she paused, and she says that she liked the smell of this perfume she had. Mm-hmm. She loved that. So she felt like that would help her ground her and bring her back to the here and now. Right. So pause and she would just take that out of her purse it was a little kind of bottle of um, some perfume she had and she would just take a really big kind of smell of it mm-hmm. and really focus on it for a minute she literally just stood there and she did it mm-hmm. and it took her about a minute or so she just concentrated on the smell she didn't think about anything else just you know she described the smell to herself it's kind of rose it's got a bit of citrus in it etc mm-hmm. she described it to herself and she kept on taking swifts of it 
and uh, within about one a few minutes her anxiety had gone down and right. what normally she do is she'd kind of because things are she kind of want to get out of the supermarkets as soon as possible but this time she was able to stay and actually continue the shopping at her own leisurely pace that sounds very helpful. So she was able to ground herself there and t- instead of quickly acting on the anxiety that she was feeling or trying to find an escape. Um, exactly. it sounds very useful. Um, Raj, um, I wonder if there's anything else that people could do in terms of grounding. Can you think of any other examples? Yeah, so basically they, in, in the, we, the other thing you can do is um, a lot of the time with anxiety gets quite strong in the body or stress or, or even mm. depression gets quite flat and you haven't got energy. Simply sure. getting up and sh- and shaking your body, body movements, mm-hmm. down, getting energy moving through the body, in a sense, because like I said, anxiety and stress like stagnant energies or depression is, especially depression is more stagnant than anxiety and stress. It's more moving, more fast. Right. But what you want to do is just by simply getting up, and I know it sounds a bit silly, but it does work if you try it to its full benefit, mm-hmm. getting up and really shaking your body out and shaking that stress out, in a sense, really shaking your body and moving around can really help you take you out of the state you're in because you're now doing a movement that's making you think about that movement more. That's mm. not stressful, it's not anxiety provoking, it's not depression provoking, in a sense, and it moves the energy around of what's stuck. And and then through that, by doing it rigorously, it can really take you out of the feeling and make you, again, as we said, ground. That's awesome. mm. That sounds really helpful, Raj. I don't know if you can hear me because sometimes you're cutting out a little bit. That's but um, yeah. yeah, that sounds very helpful. I mean, um, you're saying from if you're feeling low in mood, that can help because you can get up and, and excite your body and shake it about a bit and get the blood rushing a little bit. Um, and, and at the same time, it sounds like when a person's feeling anxious and quite elated and quite, um, you know, highly peaking in terms of uh, the stress and anxiety, it would probably help them get rid of some of that stress. Does that make sense? Is that is that what you're alluding to? It can do. I mean, anxiety, sometimes we say you need to calm the body down because anxiety is a very quick response, mm. emotional response about fear. But at the same time, sometimes you just need to kind of get yourself out of the state. And sometimes like that shift in your body movement, really rigorous kind of shaking, or maybe even tapping your whole body, you know, mm. tapping your whole body, getting that movement can really allow yourself to even with anxiety maybe, take that focus away from it and, you know, mm. and it can move the energy around your body. And, it can, and also what it does is it kind of gets the blood circulation going, especially with depression where when people are depressed, they don't have the energy, they feel flat, they feel any lack, lack of energy. So actually they need to be moving because that's what we tend to do with patients of depression. We, the first mm. kind of part of the treatment is actually improving the activity levels, getting them moving, doing things in a sense. So in a way, it's about getting the energy moving, more so with depression, but even with anxiety, it may not be the jumping around. It may be just simply body tapping, what they call your whole body from your head, not too vigorously, just gentle taps on the whole body with a bit of force, because that can get the lymphatic system moving, which moves the energy around, which then can kind of get you out of that state of what you're feeling, along with just taking long, deep breaths as you're doing that. Yeah, some people report they feel muscle spasms, don't they? <laughs> Um, and I can see how that might help with it. Um, anything else you think that might yeah. help in terms of grounding? Yeah, so basically things like, for example, if you want something more gentler, not as rigorous, for example, then like saying body shaking or anything, then you can do, like, for example, if you do think you can, um, yoga, because yoga is very good, because mm-hmm. not only does it move the body, but it, it deep, you're, deep, you're doing deep breaths at the same time. So mm-hmm. was, you can go online oh, yeah. Gentle movements for um depression for depression and anxiety because again when you move your body you're getting the blood circulating around you're getting movement happening and that and it's also very grounding yoga is because you're very much being present with your breath with your movement in a sense you're not in your mind in a sense yeah. so, so very slow movements you can do that can make you very present to the here and now and take mm-hmm. you out of your internal state in a sense that are yoga based that you can look up online so there's one called like there's um, one where you lie down shavasana pose where you lie down like with your arm and legs out and you take very long deep breaths on the ground and it can make you and you focus on the feeling of the ground against your back and your body a bit like mindfulness in mm. sense. and or there's another one which is a crowd pose which is where you kind of move your back and up and that gets kind of you shifting out the, the anxiety state into a more calmer state because you have to slow your body down in a sense somewhere around because you want to slow things down not making things fast in a sense mm. 
So mm -hmm. you also have a different kind. Or you could even do there's the thing called Qigong, which is a very slow movement. If this is more preventative, I would say, mm. but um, more slow movements, which are based on from Chinese kind of help, which is slow movements mm. to move your body, to really get you present to the here and now, you know, in a sense, which really allows you to be able to take you out of the internal state. So again, you can just put on a video on your phone from YouTube and, and then just follow it through. Simple as don't complicate it. Just follow it through when you notice with about five, ten minutes you'll kind of be out of that state of the way you're feeling and you'll be present to the here and now and grounded. Mm -hmm. now, and what about other things like um, journaling? Yeah. Because you said so, that people are, tend to be in their mind. So taking yeah. some of what's in your mind yeah. out, what, 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 what do you think journaling would help with that? Yeah, definitely journaling does help. So, um, for example, so journaling, is, journaling is basically where you get a notebook. And I know there are specific out there for journaling, but really you can just use any notebook. And what mm. you tend to do is you you kind of sit there and you don't really have to have anything in mind or you may have a topic you want to think about in your life going on that's troubling you. Or you may just randomly say, well, what's going to my mind right now? And you literally, all you do is you start writing whatever is going through your mind or if you've picked a certain topic that you're worried about, you start writing it out, whatever is going through your mind. You may wish to kind of ask yourself some questions and be inquisitive to what's worrying you or going on for you, like saying why it's making me worry, you know, what do I think will happen if I don't worry about this or why am I feeling low? And literally let your mind roll with all the thoughts going on and you just write, write and write. Now, what that does is that allows us time to sit down, to reflect, to really allow ourselves when we start writing, writing, to re it makes us start to question what writing sometimes. Say, well, actually, I didn't know I was thinking that. Actually, you know what, maybe that's what we you know, actually, I don't need to be worrying so much. It kind of sometimes can bring in understanding of a situation or clarity in a sense sometimes. But if nothing else, it can also allow us to release the thoughts out of our mind to so that we don't have the more stuck in our mind bothering us in a sense. So it's something that commonly people would do maybe in the morning because then if they're worried, they can start their day off in a good way by journeying, letting thoughts out. All this commonly is tend to do before bedtime. So mm -hmm. if you don't is you may wish to journal and 15 minutes put some nice music on and just journal whatever has gone on for you in the day or you know what you've been worried about and it might allow you some clarity or some thinking around it to get some objective thinking in and it might help you help you sleep get it all out of your mind it's on paper <clears throat> but the other thing is because it's written there a lot of the time people have anxiety worry that if they don't worry about this thought they'll kind of I don't know, they'll think, oh, my God, I might, you know, something will happen. So then they can always go back to reflect on it, you know, sure. the next day. Always it's there. been really informative having you on the show, Rajneesh, and we have quickly come towards the end of the show. Before you leave today, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, so if people just get in touch, they can go on my website, www.yourmindtherapy.co.uk. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, it, I hope that everyone's enjoyed the show. If you want to listen back to this and other shows, you can find us on Ramadan Radio's YouTube channel, Ramadan Radio Wolves. Bye for now. <laughs>